Ladies and gentlemen, in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you probably the most insane chess world record that I have ever been lucky to witness. A couple of days ago, a chess game was played on chess.com. And the two participants involved in that chess game are Magnus Carlsen, arguably the greatest chess player of all time, 17-time world chess champion, and Faustino Oro. Faustino is 10 years old, originally from Argentina. Now he's being referred to as potentially the Lionel Messi of chess. Faustino defeated Magnus Carlsen in the game that they played on chess.com. Faustino did not know how to play chess until 2020. Three and a half years ago, his account was made on chess.com. At the bottom left hand of your screen, June 2020, his blitz rating on chess.com was 200. Faustino is born in October of 2013, a month before Magnus Carlsen won the World Chess Championship. This is one of the most stunning results of a singular chess game I've ever seen in my life, and I'm going to share it with all of you. There is one small caveat to all of this hysteria that this game will cause, which I will share with you in this video. And before I show you this game, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN, or a virtual private network, and that allows you to encrypt your connection to the internet so you can browse it privately and anonymously. And as I've been saying, for the better part of a year now, there are several reasons why you may want to use a VPN. Number one, securing sensitive connections, like logging into sensitive portals, especially when you're on vacation. I've stayed at hotels that have unsecure wireless networks. It makes me feel a level of comfort to connect to a VPN before I log into some of my emails or maybe a bank. Number two, and it's a big one, your favorite shows. Shows go in and out of your catalog, depending on where you connect to your favorite streaming service in the world. But if it's always sunny in Philadelphia or The Office or any of your other favorite shows are no longer available, use Surfshark, change your location, and boom, there you go, enjoying your favorite show once again. And the last one, the biggest one of all, geopricing. The next time you want to book airfare or a hotel for a vacation or other reason, use Surfshark and connect from a different location in the world. You will be shocked at some of the savings you may experience when you connect to a VPN. Folks, you know how this works. If you're interested in securing your privacy with Surfshark, click that link in the description. And you should enter the coupon code Gotham for an extra three free months at surfshark.deals forward slash Gotham. Now that you're done securing your connection to the internet, let's get back to the video. Thank you as always to sponsored Gotham. Folks, here we go. I told you that I would share one caveat with you in this game and I will do it right now. This was a bullet game. It was a one-minute chess game played in the chess.com bullet brawl tournament. So some of you might already be looking at this and going, ah, one-minute chess! <laughs> what a, that's silly! Play him in a real game! Well, they can't, because they don't get invited to the same tournaments. Chess does not have an open-style tournament system like tennis, so I doubt Fausti and Magnus will play each other for a very long time over the board. But in today's day and age, a lot of chess is played online. And also, I would argue that a one-minute chess game against literally the best chess-playing human in history still counts for something. So, Fausti shows up to this game at uh, the age of 10 <laughs> and a half, and he opens up with d4. Now, Fausti plays everything. I've played Faustino in a match. Uh, it was very, very close. Uh, I lost by one game, but I know that he plays knight f3, e4, d... You know, he plays a handful of different openings, plays d4 in this game, and and I and, uh, Ma and I... And Magnus plays g6. The reason I said I is because I've actually played g6 many times against Faustino, and generally his playing style is to not let the opponent have fun. So what he does against me is he puts two pawns in the center, and I play d6, and then he plays like c3. He Faustino just plays very solidly, not in the most critical, not in the most aggressive way, but he's a very good practical decision maker. Uh, he's a positional player, so the, the games that he likes have a level of stability and calmness to them. Uh, and he's 10, which is crazy, because at 10 years old, most kids just want to attack, 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 attack. They want to, you know, sacrifice, blah, blah, blah. So in this game, because it's bullet, Magnus plays knight f6. You would first of all, you would never see Magnus playing this in a in a serious classical chess game period. But knight f6 in particular is a bad move uh, because you just allow White to walk into the center and attack your knight 
like that while also having very good control. That is a motif that happens in an opening known as the Alekhine or Aljokhin's defense, but you know, Magnus does it here. There's another opening that Magnus likes to play quite a lot, which is known as the Norwegian Rat or the North Sea defense. And it is very idiotic looking, but it's actually it's actually not that horrible. So he kind of goes for the same approach here, except now he cannot play knight h5 because his knight can't go there. Instead, he goes here and runs around. And this jumping around with the knight is very uh, reminiscent of e4, knight f6, e5. And as we can see, the exact same pawn structure. Watch this. I'm going to show you a magic trick. Ready? Three, two, one, doink. That's, this is actually the position that's in the game. Faustino plays knight c3. Magnus now plays d6 because that's the entire purpose of the black position. He runs around with the knight a little bit. He stops white from trapping the knight, gives the knight a breathing room. Now this bishop is going to come out. Now this bishop is going to pressure the center. So Magnus plays this kind of provocative way against the young man because he knows, look, this kid is, this kid is young. All I got to do is get into a middle game and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to overtake him. I'm going to win. Faustino, like I said, very solid. So if he has an opportunity to kind of remove tension from the game, he will. Faustino likes to play chess in a way that's not going to cause him to get a migraine. Uh, Black now plays e takes d6. Not actually the best move according to any machine. Taking with the c pawn, maintaining a level of imbalance with, you know, no e and c pawn is, is actually preferred. I'm sort of surprised Magnus took symmetrically. Uh, I would have thought maybe he would have wanted to create a little bit more of an imbalance, but he takes this way, which is fine. Uh, and now Faustino plays bishop e2. You'll notice Faustino is not losing any time at all. Uh, that's because it's bullet chess. He's playing very, very quickly. In fact, the crazy part is he actually pre-moved four moves in a row. So Faustino played this. Then he pre-moved this move. And if Magnus had known that, he would have went here to attack his queen, right? But that's obviously, you know, so he pre-moved this. Then he pre-moved this move as well, which is very funny because that was a capture. And then he knew Magnus would take back, so he pre-moved this move as well. So Faustino pre-moving the entire opening, okay? Castles, castles, like I said. Faustino likes stability. Magnus, his pieces are sniping the white position from a distance. The game plan for black is to move the bishop to the center and then take the knight. Uh, and by the way, just a little side note, if my microphone cuts out a little bit, it's been having some problems recently, I'm going to get a new one, uh, but uh, if you randomly can't hear me, that I, I actually wouldn't know, because it's been cutting in and out for no reason. So we see this move, bishop g4 from Magnus, right? This bishop is a little bit overloaded, it's defending two different things, but you can't really take here, because then you will just get your piece trapped in the corner, okay? So bishop g4. White can do a lot of things here. White can play bishop e3, bishop f4, bishop g5, rook e1. You can play for h3, you can play b3. And Faustino, very, very solid. He's just going to play b3. He's just making sure everything in the position is protected. This now loses a little bit of stability, but black is never really successfully going to play c5 uh, because then white will play bishop e3 and rook c1 and just finish up his development. So Magnus has gotten all his pieces out. So how's Faustino? Both guys have developed their armies. Now what, right? Black can play d5. Black can play rook e8 to activate yet, oh, activate yet another piece. Very, very tough game. Very tough position. A lot of decisions yet to be made. In fact, that is what happens. Rook 2 e8. And like I said, Faustino is a simple man. He played pawn to b3 to defend the pawn on c4 to enable the movement of the bishop, which is why he plays h3. Now, if I'm playing black here, I'm playing bishop f5. I actually don't really want to take. Uh, I would rather slide the bishop back to the f5 square just so it survives just so I have some activity, right? Just so I'm doing something. Magnus, though, follows the bishop into the position and decides to chop off on f3 and pressure the position like this. Now, if you ever want to move your knight, you're going to need to defend the pawn on b7, which is why this is the longest thought of the game that Magnus takes, and he plays rook to b8. And again, there is no imbalance. Like, the, the pawn structure is completely the same. White just has an advantage now, which is traditionally known as the bishop pair. It is better to have two bishops than it is a bishop and a knight, in particular on an open board, because the bishop can see to the opposite corner of, 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 of Earth, really. Uh, and uh, yeah, everything in Faustino's position is perfect. Now, the, the problem with Faustino as a player, when you are his opponent, is he takes his time. He doesn't just get this little pleasant position and go d5, and then, you know, obviously that lose the knight, but I'm just saying, like, he doesn't just give up weaknesses that easily. He's very annoying to play against. So 
In the span of 0.6 seconds, he just plays queen d2. The idea of queen d2 is just he's protecting everything and he's going to bring his rooks to the center. Like, he just doesn't weaken his position. You have to provoke Faustino in order to get something going in this game. Magnus was ready. That's why he took on f3, right? That's why he played rook b8. He's now going to wrap the knight to the f5 square. And that is exactly what he does. Now, again, this type of play by Faustino is not necessarily always the best, but it is very, very solid and very annoying. Like, right now, it very well could be the best move could be to go g4. You know, it, it, I don't think it is, but a move like g4 is not even half bad. In fact, it's one of the best moves in the position. Now black has to play d5. If black doesn't, black is going to be much worse. You see, like, me personally, I would play g4 here, put my bishop back, and then even bring more pawns just to control this. I'm not worried about weakening my king, but that's the difference between myself and Faustino. Faustino's like, you know what? I don't really care if Magnus wants to put the knight on f5. I'm not going to weaken my position to try to thwart my opponent's plans. Knight f5. Well, now Magnus is making progress, right? Now the advantage is kind of gone. It's back to point one. He's going to take on e3, so the white's bishop pair advantage is gone, and then black is going to have pressure on that pawn. So he's going to put the bishop on h6, for example, which is very annoying. Very annoying. And Faustino plays rook e1. Magnus takes. Faustino plays rook takes. Nice little trick. Right? He takes with the rook because the alternative was to take with the pawn and then potentially risk just having this annoying situation over here and then here comes Magnus on the dark squares and again, it's just about controlling your opponent's imbalances. So Faustino sets a mini trap. Mini. Mini because Magnus would never fall for this. This move looks like it pins the rook to the queen, but the rook can move and the rook will go here, taking the rook and it's check. That is the most important thing. And then all of a sudden, Faustino will be up a full bishop. But Magnus is not just going to lose a piece like that. Okay? Rook e3, queen e3. Faustino gets out of the opening. The bishop is not getting to h6. This bishop is very strong, pressuring that side of the board. This knight is looking a little bit offside, like it can't really go anywhere. This rook is going to control this. The only thing Magnus really has going for him is the pressure on white center. But, white, but he's about to go c5. Like a6, white's next move is c5. And suddenly the position for black is falling apart. I mean, it's completely being disintegrated. So, very tough moment already. And an and, and, and unsuccessful opening. Definitely. For the uh, former world champion, but, you know, GOAT. Yeah, not a great opening. And Faustino has played 18 moves in 8 seconds. So, the initiative, the momentum of the game is definitely with Faustino. So much so, that in this position, Magnus decides to bail out. Magnus could play in a way here that's provocative. Like, he could play knight d7. What does that do, right? Well, you just take the whole file, right? But then he's going to play c6. And basically, this is like when a fighter puts his fists up and he just like, come on, come get me. I'm going to sit right back here. I'm going to wait for you to come to me. I know, you know, and I know you have the better position. You got to come to me, right? He could have played like that. He could have played a little bit more cagey, but he decides... And he does a little calculation here. He forces the issue. Queen e8. That's a massive decision because the queens are coming off the board. But more importantly, that rook has to guard that pawn. So Magnus already admitting that Faustino has a better position. And he is fine losing the pawn on b7 to potentially create some counterplay with the move c5. Here's the problem. Okay, here's the problem with this plan, is that best case scenario, black will make a draw. Black is now just down a pawn in an endgame. He has six pawns, white has seven. Now, if everything gets traded here, like let's, I'm, again, this is not what's going to happen, but let's just say the rooks come off, right? The rooks get traded, okay? And then in a couple of moves, some other stuff gets traded, all right? Like, you know, black can take on d4, but then we have knight b5, like... What's going to happen in this game is if the bishops go on the opposite color, it's going to be a draw. So this is a draw. Look how quickly it went down to zeros. So it's about keeping material on the board. And Max doesn't have to do this, but Faustino is like, wait a minute, c5. Uh, that's hanging and that's hanging. Knight b5. I couldn't take. And suddenly black is much worse. So all of a sudden, the best chess player of all time is in a situation where a split-second decision to force the issue in the game leaves him with a very unpleasant endgame. He's not going to be playing this for a win. I mean, if he was playing me, he'd be playing it for a win. 
but he's not going to be playing it for a win. And if he takes on d4, all the pawns will fall. All of them. You're going to take on d6, and then it's very simple. We're going to advance this pawn until it becomes a queen. So he plays rook e7. He attacks the bishop on b7. Faustino, by the way, could take on d6 here to defend himself, but then you would get bishop d4 and some pressure, and the rook is coming down to e2. So even here, with a free pawn, completely free, Faustino says, no thank you. No thank you. Because he understands that black wants counterplay. So now Magnus plays a6. Magnus undermining the knight and the defense of the pawn. Magnus wants to land the bishop on that square to put pressure. Faustino takes on c5, puts the knight on d6, and we have rook to d7. It would have been slightly better for him to actually take on d6 and allow bishop d4. But this is a tough position to allow. This bishop is very strong. So instead of that, he tries to go for this. Still knight d6, is, uh, bishop d4 is playable. But okay, rook d7. Now what do you do? So again, Faustino has a very solid, straightforward, kind of no-nonsense playing style. The best way for white to play here, to win against this uh, majority, is to play b4. b4 undermines bishop d4. And if pawn takes, you push to c5. And then if black plays something like knight a4, you have bishop c6. If black plays something like knight c... Really, I don't even know what you can do, by the way. The knight is almost trapped. You have to look for magic like bishop e5. So if takes, there's takes. And then you play from here. Faustino just... Very simple. Very, very simple. Knight e4. Not concerned about any of these tactics. Just trades. Magnus does, in fact, put the bishop on d4. Now, in a long time control game, this is likely going to end in a draw. Because, again... Black's disadvantage is no b-pawn. Black is down a b-pawn. In a king and pawn endgame, it's losing. In a knight endgame, it's losable. In an opposite colored bishop endgame, it's not losable. And if you don't understand why, opposite colored bishop endgames are notoriously very, very, very difficult to win. Because if you do the math, at the end, the bishop could sacrifice itself for the remaining pawn and it would be a draw. Uh, and there, really, there's nothing, there's no way the bishops could interfere with each other. So this would probably be a draw. King f1, king e2, right? Faustino's gonna play, though. I mean, it's a bullet game. What are you gonna do, offer a draw? No, never. King e7. He plays f4. Magnus plays f5. So these pawns are on the same color square as this bishop. If the bishop ever makes it over there, it's gonna be really bad news. It's gonna be like Big Bad Wolf blowing on the house. Knight f2. a5. Magnus creating a dark squared fortress with the pawns on c5 and a5. Faustino plays knight to d3. In a, per in a perfect scenario, what will happen here for white? Absolutely best case is something like this, okay? Uh, King d2, let's just say, you know, black literally does nothing except shuffle. You would play something like king c2, knight b6, a3, knight c8, and you would try to play b4. And after you successfully play b4, you now have a one on zero, right? So now you're going to go over here and you're going to try to push the pawn. But if you notice, it's, it's not looking particularly promising. That is the idea. King f3, knight e1. Both guys are shuffling, but Magnus completely just taking over, right? I mean, the knight gets into c3. He forces Faustino to make a pawn move. Yeah, that's it. Now this is white's extra pawn. It's this ugly duckling on b3. It's never going to go forward. There's no way to get to a5 or c5. Uh, yeah, it's just a draw. Knight to a2. Faustino plays g4. He's still trying. He's still trying. Magnus plays king f6. Smart move. Knight to d3. Knight to c3. Knight c1. And in this position, disaster strikes. Disaster strikes. Magnus just moved from a2. He just brought the knight from the a2 square. And I think what he was thinking to do here is to continue to shuffle. What Magnus should do in this position is probably just move the king back and forth. I guess he could also play bishop g1, bishop d4. But black can't do anything. There's no, there's nothing. Black just has to move back and forth. And black shouldn't take. There's no need to allow to, white have to have more space like this. But in the middle of bullet shuffling, Magnus plays knight a2. <laughs> It's bullet, which is why, you know, I, I hesitated in covering this game because I was like, it's not as if it was a wire to wire victory. It's not as if it was a, you know, a pounding of Magnus. And no, they were shuffling late in the game. And, uh, it, it, you know, it happens. It's bullet. But I will say just the ability to just completely stay toe to toe with Magnus and have zero chance of losing and be up a pawn at 10 years old? 
Very impressive. And yeah, it just, you know, I'm not saying the victory in and of itself was impressive. I think Faustino will be the first to tell you that. But at this point, Faustino was on stream. He was streaming this game and he was like, oh, if I lose this, if I, if I can't win this game, uh, I should retire. And uh, yeah, to retire at 10 years old, by the way. Uh, and now just very simple, by the way. You have to extract this knight from the edge of the board. The only way to do that is to bring the king. He wins control of the dark squares. Knight c3. Knight d5 check, king c2, he kicks out the bishop, and he just takes it. And um, that is by far the easiest. And now this bishop sees this pawn, so the king cannot actually leave the pawn. And uh, the way you would win this with white is you would play king d2. Black would play king g6, king e2. Anytime king moves, you would take, so you would walk the king over here. Black would run out of moves, you would take this pawn, you would take, and then you would queen, and then you would win, which is why on the 48th move... Faustino Oro played King D2 and Magnus Carlsen resigned. Now, again, I'm going to tell you right now, even for the Argentinian fans who watch this, I think you can understand that there are more impressive ways to win a chess game than the opponent, you know, just play, playing really quickly and making a mistake like this. So some of you are going to be disappointed, okay? The chess purists are going to watch this and go, he didn't actually beat him. Play him in person. Play him in a five-minute game. Play him in a classical. Play him 10 more bullet games. See what happens. I understand. Yes, Magnus Carlsen is a better chess player than Faustino Oro. For now, we don't know what's going to happen with Faustino's career. I understand all of that. This doesn't make it any less impressive. Faustino had a fantastic opening. He played solidly. He played great. And he forced Magnus to make an uncomfortable decision, make a couple of inaccuracies, and he was at, in no danger of losing this game ever. And I will remind you, as I did with the full screen... The kid did not know how to play chess in 2020. He learned how to play chess in the middle of 2020. At the end of 2020, he was 1,500. He is now a 2,900 blitz-rated player. He's in the top 0.0001% of chess players in the world on chess.com. He's 2,300 over the board. Uh, he has one IM norm to become an international master. And he's, he's the youngest player ever in history to become a FIDE master and get an international master norm. And he just beat the GOAT. He learned chess three and a half years ago. He just beat the greatest chess player of all time. I don't even know what else to say. How's that? Get out of here.